about what the thyroid gland is and what it does. The thyroid gland consists of two lobes on either side of the trachea, just below the larynx. It secretes mostly a hormone called T4, but a little bit of a hormone called T3, which we'll talk about a little bit later. It responds to TSH, or thyroid stimulating hormone, from the pituitary. And then the pituitary responds to TRH from the hypothalamus, which is part of the brain. Thyroid hormone is vital for proper growth, development, and reproductive health. It affects metabolism both literally and can participate in the metabolism of fats and carbohydrates from food. It helps to regulate heart rate, blood pressure, and the strength of the heart. It can act on all cells in the body to some extent by enhancing a process called gene transcription, which helps the cells function properly. And this includes skin cells and hair follicles, as well as immune cells. And it also plays a role in calcium balance through a hormone called calcitonin. Dogs versus cats, who gets which disease? Dogs get hypothyroidism and cats get hyperthyroidism. But humans either. Uh, nobody seems to know why and nobody really seems to know the cause. But a couple of theories include vaccination and an immune-mediated reaction, particularly in dogs, a processed diet causing a pro-inflammatory state, and chemical exposure to certain endocrine disruptor chemicals, which can sometimes have a similar chemical structure to thyroid hormone and may cause endocrine confusion. We're going to start by talking about dogs. Oh, somehow my slide got a little compressed and the M got on the bottom. So that says hypothyroidism. And it, so it affects dogs. It is too low an amount of thyroid hormone. And it can only affect cats if it's what's called iatrogenic, meaning it's caused by treatment for hyperthyroidism, which is pretty, pretty rare to have the treatment be so much that the cat becomes hypothyroid. Genetics may play a role because certain breeds are known to be predisposed. It's kind of a lengthy list, but some of these breeds include Golden Retrievers, Labrador Retrievers, Cocker Spaniels, Great Dane, Old English Sheepdogs, Boxers, Poodles, Irish Setters, Dachshunds, Miniature Schnauzers, Doberman Pinchers, and Airedale Terriers. Oh, whoops, sorry. So rabies vaccination may also play a role. Dr. Jean Dodd's research has shown that with every rabies vaccination, there's at least a temporary increase in something called, th called thyroid autoantibodies. And these are antibodies against the thyroid gland. They're mistakenly read out as hormone by most total T4 assays. And the presence of these antibodies will cause a potentially hypothyroid dog to have normal total T4 blood levels. Diet may play a role, as we mentioned before, processed diets causing a pro-inflammatory state, and that may contribute to hypothyroidism. Signs of hypothyroidism include recurrent bacterial overgrowth on the skin. You could use the word infection, but because bacteria are always present on the skin, they and they only become a problem when an opportunity presents itself. It's, they're there all the time. They just happen to overgrow. So when the skin barrier or the immunity is disrupted. Oh. Sorry, another symptom is symmetrical fur loss, meaning it's the same looking on both sides without any itching. This may start as small bald patches, usually along the flank and sides, as you can see in the picture of this boxer. Other signs include weight gain and sluggishness, a dry, dull coat, and potentially neuromuscular problems. More symptoms include dry eye, corneal lipid or fat deposits, a droopiness to the facial skin causing a tragic looking face. This is really a characteristic symptom in people. 
Other signs can include neuropathies, possibly involving the laryngeal nerve, facial nerves, or other nerves, behavioral changes, including aggression, irritability, or fatigue, GI signs that may include diarrhea or vomiting, and possibly other signs. The diagnosis of hypo hypothyroidism can sometimes be a little tricky. A total T4 alone is not enough to have a diagnosis of hypothyroidism. There are many different medications and conditions that can cause an artificial decrease in total thyroid hormone, causing a non-hypothyroid patient to be diagnosed. These drugs include steroids, phenobarbital, which is this anti-seizure medication, and certain antibiotics. Also, during certain times, the body may purposely decrease thyroid hormone production in certain conditions to conserve energy when it may be needed for other purposes, such as fighting off an infection or fighting off cancer. And this is how hypothyroidism can be overdiagnosed. Another test is called a free T4 by dialysis, usually a process called equilibrium dialysis. Because most thyroid hormone is bound to protein within the blood, it's readily affected by other conditions going on. But this free T4, or it measures the non-protein bound fraction of hormone, this subset of hormone is not as likely to be affected by other conditions going on in the body. Another test is called canine thyroid stimulating hormone. So thyroid stimulating hormone, as we mentioned, it tells the thyroid to produce more thyroid hormone. If it's low, this may be primary or inherited hypothyroidism. And if it's high, it means the thyroid gland can't meet the demand for thyroid hormone, and it can be diagnostic for acquired hypothyroidism. Total T3. So T3 or triiodothyronin is actually the active version of thyroid hormone. It's 10 times more potent than T4, but it makes up only about 10% of what gets released from the actual thyroid gland. The rest of the hormone becomes active through one iodine molecule getting chopped off through a process in the liver that requires adequate amounts of selenium. Free T3 is similar to free T4, it's just T3. And thyroid autoantibodies, these are antibodies against thyroid tissue. They can, as we mentioned before, be falsely interpreted as T4 by a panel that only measures a total T4. So it's very easy to miss the diagnosis if you're measuring just a total T4. And they indicate that there's autoimmune thyroid disease, which maybe due to vaccination or possibly inherited. Treatment of hypothyroidism can be done in a couple of different ways. Depends a little bit on the severity of the deficiency of hormone. We can use natural thyroid support in the form of nutrient supplements that help support the thyroid. These typically contain various vitamins as well as selenium, iodine, and magnesium as well as some of the precursor amino acids that make up thyroid hormones, such as tyrosine. Some examples, some of them also contain glandular extracts, and two examples are thyrostim and thyrocomplex. We can use animal-derived hormone supplements. These are extracted from the thyroid of pigs or cows. Most of these contain both T4 and a little bit of T3, and that's sort of the potential advantage of these supplements. However, if the patient has enough selenium, which catalyzes the making of T4 into T3, they likely don't really need much, if any, T3 supplemented. And these supplements are significantly more costly than the synthetic supplements. So, and usually more needs to be given. Synthetic thyroid supplements seems to be the most common way to treat hypothyroidism. It's a product called levothyroxine. Dogs do metabolize thyroid hormone much faster than humans. 
they actually metabolize it 10 times as fast as we do. So their dose has to be 10 times as much as ours. I've occasionally had a pharmacist call me up and ask me, is this the correct dose? Because they're used to giving such low doses to people. Minimizing vaccination. We strongly recommend in any patient diagnosed with or thought to have hypothyroidism because of the potential autoimmune connection to minimize vaccination and only give rabies as required by law. Can hypothyroidism be reversed? Yes, in some instances, as long as there is still enough functioning thyroid tissue to keep up with the demand for thyroid hormone. So how do you know this? Well, stop supplementation and monitor hormone levels as well as how the patient is doing. How can we prevent hypothyroidism? Through careful, responsible breeding, judicious use of vaccination, and making sure the diet has adequate amounts of iodine, selenium, and certain other nutrients that help to support the thyroid. We're going to switch gears now and talk about hyperthyroidism. So hyperthyroidism affects cats. It is an excess of thyroid hormone caused by an overactive thyroid gland. If this is most often a benign tumor or a goiter, it's rarely ectopic, meaning it could be outside of the actual thyroid gland, which would mean it's, it's usually within the chest. No specific cause has been identified, but possible contributing factors include flame retardant chemicals that can disrupt thyroid hormone, gluten and BPA and possibly other chemicals that again may disrupt thyroid hormone, drugs which can affect the synthesis and function of thyroid hormones. These include those same drugs we talked about before, steroids and certain anti-seizure medications. Processed diet causing low-grade inflammation, which can affect the thyroid gland. And at least in humans, both hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism have to some extent been linked to autoimmune disease. So how does the thyroid gland become hyperactive? Well, normal thyroid function, as we touched a little bit on earlier, it works through a feedback system between the hypothalamus in the brain, the pituitary, and the thyroid. So when thyroid hormone is needed, the signal comes out for TRH to the pituitary, to TSH to the thyroid gland, and the thyroid produces adequate amounts of thyroid hormone. When there's adequate amounts, the process gets shut down and until thyroid hormone is needed again. Drugs and other substances that interfere with T4 may confuse this feedback system and the signal is not getting to the hypothalamus or to the pituitary to shut off their TRH or TSH. So the signal keeps getting put out to make more and more and more. Eventually the thyroid just gets bigger to try to meet this demand. You get a goiter and you have an overactive thyroid gland. Signs of hyperthyroidism include weight loss, increased appetite, increased thirst, diarrhea or vomiting, strange behavior, especially at night. Typically, this is yowling or being awake and, and mischievous at all hours, and irritability, which can sometimes be due to hypertension. Diagnosis of hyperthyroidism should include most or all of the following. A thorough physical exam. A thorough veterinarian will not diagnose hyperthyroidism without at least two of the three following symptoms being present. Weight loss and a rapid heart rate. Most but not all of the time, also a goiter or an enlarged thyroid gland will be palpable. A total T4 level should be run. In many cases, though, a free T4 by equilibrium dialysis is also needed. Many current conditions, such as kidney disease or intestinal problems, can artificially decrease the total T4, kind of the same way we talked about with the dog, and make it appear within the normal range, even though the patient is actually hyperthyroid. 
if your cat has symptoms of this disease and your cat's total T4 is normal, ask your veterinarian if they can run a thyroid panel that includes a free T4 by equilibrium dialysis. There's no good feline TSH assay right now or way to measure that, but if we could, I imagine we would find high levels in these hyperthyroid cats. Treatment of hyperthyroidism is done primarily in one of three ways. Radioactive iodine therapy has sort of become the mainstream way, or at least the most frequently recommended and most successful way of treating it. It is the most costly, but it can be very effective. It is using basically a radioactive isotope of iodine, which the thyroid picks up readily. And then because it's radioactive, it actually destroys some of the thyroid tissue so that it cannot produce as much thyroid hormone. It does require a specialized facility to handle the radioactive material and typically about a three-day stay for the kitty being treated. A second way of treatment is surgery to actually remove the thyroid glands, but this has really fallen out of favor since radioactive iodine has become so readily available. It is the most risky because it involves anesthesia and the risk of hypoparathyroidism if the parathyroid glands are inadvertently removed. Another very common way of treating is using antithyroid medication. Typically this is a drug called methimazole. The brand name is, used to be tapazole since, since it's gone generic. Uh, I just refer to it as methimazole, just confuses people if you say tapazole. This drug actually interferes with the formation of thyroid hormone. It can sometimes have some pretty intense side effects. So these can include changes in blood cell counts, including anemia or decreases in white blood cells. This is why checking blood counts, especially in the early days, is vitally important to ensure that your cat doesn't have any of these severe, potentially life-threatening reactions. Another possible side effect of this medication is severe itching of the face, as well as rashes and scabs from self-mutilation. I've seen the occasional cat that gets this so badly that the drug needs to be stopped. So are there other options? There are some other options that can help, especially perhaps in mild or early cases. Diet change to the least processed diet, preferably raw is advised, and this will help decrease in GI inflammation and in turn decrease systemic inflammation. There are various herbs that can help, and homeopathy may be able to help, but none of my mentors or colleagues has ever actually cured a hyperthyroid patient, but it can help with signs and symptoms. Monitoring of the thyroid patient. This goes pretty much for both dogs and cats. Monitoring of these guys is extremely important to make sure they're on the correct dose of medication, to check for other issues that were masked by their thyroid disease, and to check for side effects. So initially, all of these patients should have some sort of monitoring and examination within 30 days of being started on medication and thereafter typically every three to six months. It's a good idea, especially with cats, to monitor their weight monthly at home and to monitor their signs for normalization. Things like thirst and appetite can be measured. Diarrhea and vomiting can also be measured to some extent and their behavior. Questions that you should ask your veterinarian uh, when you think your pet may have thyroid disease or if they have decided to test your pet for thyroid disease. For dogs, ask if your dog has gained weight. Ask if their heart rate was low normal. I have almost never seen a dog that was truly hypothyroid with a high heart rate. Ask if they will test more than just a total T4. We covered why that's important before. And ask what the T3 level was. 
if the T3 level is low but the T4 level is normal, well, your pet may just need selenium supplementation or other nutritional thyroid support. Because remember, selenium helps to catalyze the transformation of T4 into the active hormone T3. Ask if your dog's liver function appears to be normal. If the answer is no, well, your pet may need nutritional supplementation to support the liver, as well as perhaps selenium, because again, the liver participates in making T4 into active T3. For cats, ask, will you test more than just a total T4? For cats, usually the T4 with the free T4 by equilibrium dialysis is sufficient. And we, we talked about why a little bit earlier, but because the free or non-protein bound fractions not affected by other conditions. So ask if your cat has lost weight. Ask if your cat has a higher or high normal heart rate. I have never seen a hyperthyroid cat with a low or low normal heart rate. Ask if your cat has a goiter. If the answer to at least two of these above questions is not yes, your cat is not truly hyperthyroid. All patients with thyroid disease, as mentioned earlier, should have minimal vaccinations because both hypo and hyperthyroid are thought to be attributed to autoimmune conditions. A couple of resources I did want to mention for more information. I, I for one, found Dr. Jean Dodds and Diana Lavender's book, The Canine Thyroid Epidemic, very eye-opening, and I highly recommend it. A book for, for kitties by well-known uh, feline expert, Dr. Elizabeth Hodgkins, is called Your Cat, Simple New Secrets to a Longer, Stronger Life. And two websites, the first one, is a site run by renowned veterinary endocrinologist, Dr. Mark E. Peterson. And the second one is the site for the Win Feline Foundation, which is very progressive as far as information for cats goes. Well, that's, that's all I have. I'll take a few minutes to see if there are any questions. Um, one question that, that I thought, I didn't know if anybody was going to ask this, but I thought somebody might, so I'll sort of beat you to the punch, is whether spaying and neutering, or whether I think spaying and neutering has anything to do with either of these conditions. I can't say for certain that it doesn't. Obviously, the body and these all these endocrine organs are interconnected, so it, it could. There's been no real research that proves that, but I can't say that it can't. So who knows? Maybe someday somebody will, will do some research about it. Well, if, if there aren't any questions, and, and that's okay if there aren't, I just want to thank everybody for joining us. If you missed any portion, just remember that all of our webinars are available on our YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and search Natural Pet Animal Hospital. And then please join us next month, the last Tuesday of the month, where we're going to talk about joint disease. Thanks a lot, everybody. Have a good night.